second. Our topic today is featured teacher, and our featured teacher and guest is Holly Hargrave. You'll see the, a link there to her webpage, and we'll be talking about how you can access more information about Holly, our guest, today. We use something called the Classroom 20 Live Binder, and we'll have that link dropped into the session frequently. The Live Binder is a great way to uh, collect all the resources that Holly is going to be sharing with us today, as well as please note that we do have a Classroom 20 Live Resources tab that you can have access. If you missed the survey we talked about at the end of the show, you'll find it there. Or if you need any other explanation of our resources, you can go there to Classroom 20 Live, and it's all set up for you today. It's a tremendous tool, and you'll be uh, very happy that we put it together today. Feel free to come back to our site, live.classroom20live, for the archives and resources page because you're going to find the chat log, which goes by very quick, quickly. We keep a record of it for you there. You can go back and refer it to you again. We have the full Blackboard Collaborate recording. We have an audio file, and we have an embedded movie file, which you can actually use and uh, take it and, and share it with people on your staff or anyone else. Um, simply by coming again to our website and archives and resources, we direct you there because not only do we have those four items, we also have the links posted there that match the links in the live binder. And if there are appropriate links that people have shared during the session, you'll find those links also on our uh, archives and resources page. This is the time I want to put you all to work, and if you were able to hear me, you recall on the left-hand side of the whiteboard is your whiteboard tools. I want you to click on that starburst and pop in by dragging it over onto the screen. Let us know where you are located. And if that doesn't work, or you also want to type it in the chat, please feel free to do that. Uh, I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario in Canada. We have quite a few people in the States. Peggy's in Phoenix, Arizona. I know that uh, Kim is in San Antonio, Texas. Our guest is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, if I'm right. Thank you, Lori's in central Pennsylvania. Great. A few more people need to make that starburst work. If you missed it, it's on the left-hand side of your screen, second icon down. There we go. A few more people are showing us where they're located. But the chat works fine, too. It's a great way to see how far and wide our network works in for our show. So now we're going to move on to the next part is poll questions. I don't want to take too long. So if you miss the poll question, just type your answer here. If you recall, we have an A to E option. And uh, the question is, what is your role in education? That's going to help Holly know who her audience is. So please let us know if you're a K to 8 teacher, secondary or post-secondary teacher, administrator, distance learning instructor, or please type other in the chat. waiting for the results, and I'm going to post them to page. And so we've got a kind of a, a crossover here of uh, others and uh, a lot of K-8 teachers. Let's go to our next poll question. I just need to change your voting options. Just a second, I'll do that. So our next question is, do more than 50% of the students at your school have internet access at home? Do more than 50% of the students at your school have internet access at home? Hoping everybody can get that fourth icon to the right under your name and click at it drop down menu and you'll get the voting option. Okay, I'm going to stop the voting and publish the results. I think there's a lot of people here, over 50% of the people who are actually giving me an answer and it's still coming up here, that uh, actually it's terrific to know that um, they do have access to the internet at home. Poll question number three, just move on to that question. Do you use Edmodo, either with students or professionally? So 
So yes, if you do, no, if you don't. Putting you to work rather quickly. I'm quickly seeing this by the votes. I think it's pretty much 50-50 at the moment of uh, our audience is using Edmodo. So for those of you who are not, I know uh, that Holly's going to share some great advice on how to do that. Our next poll question is um, about using Glogster. If you want to go ahead and let us know if you are using Glogster with your students. Which results here again. We have a split again, 30-30-30. Um, For those of you who are not, please just type it in the chat so Holly does have some sense of whether you are using the tool or not. So thank you very much for voting, everyone. I am now going to move on to uh, my great opportunity to introduce our guest today. As I said, she's our feature today. And if you want to find her website, it's hargrovia.weebly.com. Holly is a middle school teacher in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. She teaches language arts to gifted students in grade 6. She's also the English department chair and instructional council chair. She's been a sponsor for the Speech and Debate Club and a co-sponsor of WEB, Where Everyone Belongs. That's a nice acronym, and I hope she explains that to us. And she also serves as the cooperating teacher with the University of New Mexico's education. It is my opportunity to welcome you this morning, Holly. I know you've got a great presentation ready for us, and if you want to add anything more to the introduction when you start, please feel free to do that. But uh, I'm going to leave you with our newbie question, which we pose to all our future teachers, and that is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So welcome, Holly, and I'm turning it over to you now. OK, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, it's really exciting to be able to contribute to what's already such an incredible resource you guys have put together. And um, it's great to engage in the conversations you're having around innovation in the classroom. It looks like we have a lot of people here who are pretty tech savvy. And I'm hoping to learn as much as you guys are today. So um, just to give you a little bit more background about me, um, I am in Albuquerque. I'm at a middle school. Um, and I do teach gifted students language arts. And in New Mexico, gifted is considered special education. So all of my students have IEPs, just like any special ed student. And they had to test you know, to get into the program. So my classes are small, um, usually about 8 to 10 kids. So that's a little different than I think most people nationally um, experience with gifted students. Um, but to get to this newbie question, what does uh, Web 2.0 mean to me and why do I use it, I'm actually going to move us to the next slide here because um, I went ahead and answered it um, here. And I, I think of web-based applications and tools that are interactive. So they're not just static. You can actually um, and do something with the websites that you are visiting. And collaboration is a big piece for web tools. Um, and I think that it's kind of expanded um, our classroom walls so that we can work with and learn from and share with um, people and students all over the world. And it really has kind of given us an alternative way to acquire information, to interact with it, and to share it. So that's kind of my take on what Web 2.0 is. All right. So um, one more thing I want to mention right before we really jump in is that I do not in any way consider myself to be a technology expert. I'm not the person that my colleagues run to you know, when their computers are going haywire, or they need a printer set up, or whatever. And I just think it's important to say that because even though I, I'm not a tech guru, I'm still able to incorporate technology and web tools into my curriculum because, um, well, number one, I'm totally cool with learning alongside my students. I don't mind making mistakes and modeling what real learning looks like, which is messy. So they see me fumble at times with the new tools that I'm using with them, but I try to keep it positive and keep it productive. Plus, they, they often teach me a lot about the applications and websites that we're using. And they love the chance to share what they already know and to bring in ideas from home that they've used. So um, the other thing that kind of frees me up to use technology, even though I may not consider myself an expert, is that you know most of the tools out there 
are pretty user friendly. So with just a little bit of prep, you can jump in and start doing really cool things with your students. You truly don't have to be a computer scientist or anything to get your students involved with amazing technology. So um, on with the presentation. I'm going to first start um, by going to a Prezi. Let me make sure I can do this correctly. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm going to take you guys to a little Prezi right now. Hopefully that is working. Um, this is a Prezi that I put together with a colleague of mine, Rosemary Stevenson, who I believe is here. I'm actually at her house, so she better be on the chat today. Um, and she and I have been colleagues at my middle school for, um, for years. And she now is a teacher at the local Central New Mexico Community College, and she's teaching teachers how to become gifted teachers, since you have to be certified in New Mexico for that. So um, we put this together actually, so I want to make sure she gets credit for that, but um, this is kind of how I approach the use of technology in my curriculum. So my first rule of thumb is that I don't want to use technology for its own sake, you know, just to use it. It's easy, I think, to get seduced by all the bells and whistles that some sites offer and then try to force that site or activity into a unit simply because it's so engaging even though sometimes it may not make sense in terms of what the students are supposed to be learning. Um, plus Holly, only excuse me. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you make sure that your browser is completely on top of your Blackboard Collaborate? Because we're seeing those gray boxes um, that are blocking some of it. That's perfect. Great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we just, we didn't, we know how hard it is to sort of sort through all of the trillions, it seems like, web tools that are out there. Um, and as teachers, we just frankly don't always have time to do the kind of quality sorting that we need to, and it can get overwhelming. So we sort of put our heads together and we talked about, you know, how, how do we help our teachers at our school approach the use of technology? And um, I don't think it's anything earth shattering, but we kind of came up with a pedagogical process for evaluating tech tools. Tech tools. And, um, we love acronyms as teachers, right? So we, uh, we used an acronym called uh, Critical SIFT. And um, what we've tried to do is use our own critical and creative thinking to sort through web tools um, so we can fit the tools to the learning objectives so that we can shift our best, best practices to the digital world. And then we want to model that same kind of critical and creative thinking that we're using to filter through tools for our students. So here's the acronym. And so um, I think that basically what we have to keep in mind is that you know, we have this old paradigm, which has been more or less to keep doing what we've always done, only using technology to do it faster or more efficiently. And we would like to see a shift towards a system that acknowledges that you know, technology isn't just about doing old things better, but that it fundamentally changes or transforms how we interact with knowledge and how we interact with each other as learners and teachers, and how our students are going to be expected to process and access information as adults. I like to say that educators really no longer have the power to successfully predict you know, exactly which skills, knowledge, and um, I guess worldviews, if you want to put it that way, will be needed as, as our students enter adulthood, because the pace of change has really just accelerated. And we've seen it. We've seen how much technology has really pervaded the culture now. It's everywhere. And so we really can't continue, in my mind, to treat education the way we always have, which I think is sort of a relay race across the generations, you know, where one generation turns and hands over, here's the entirety of knowledge to the next generation. Because if you think about it, not only is the base of knowledge changing, even as we try to hand it down, the whole process by which new generations are really expected to be given that knowledge, how they expect to, to be instructed, and, and gain knowledge is changing. So we're really in a time of transition. And this critical shift, I think, is our way of trying to negotiate that transition. So the, the S is for set learning objectives. And just like with any, any activity we're doing with our students, we want to start with the, with the end in mind. It's not a newsflash. Um, but we want to know where they're supposed to get to by the end of the, of the lesson. And when it comes to tech tools, it can be so easy to get sidetracked. There's so many amazing things out there in cyberland. So if we always go back to what are students supposed to learn, 
or be able to do, then we can keep it focused on our objective and make sure that we're spending our, our precious class time wisely. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Sorry about that. <laughs> the I is for investigate the relationship of the learning objective to the web tools. And that's where a site like this one I think is so great. Um, you know, you guys have a place for educators to share their favorite tools like I'm doing today. And um, that saves a lot of time. It helps us from, you know, wandering off into the digital wilderness looking for what we need because we can really um, learn from one another. Um, but that's the fun part, too, is investigating the tools that are out there. And then we want to do the F, which is fit the tool to the objective, not the objective to the tool. And this is where Live Binders, I think, and Pinterest really come in handy because I know when I'm looking for things, I get so excited every time I stumble across a new cool site or a tool, and my, re my immediate reaction is usually, oh, I've got to use this right now. But I've trained myself to instead just pin it if I'm on Pinterest, and then later organize all my pins into my Live Binders. Um, by what I think they would be best suited for. And that way I don't forget about the site, but I can come back to it later when I'm working on a learning objective with my students that that particular tool would actually make more sense to use. So that's what I love about Live Binders and about uh, Pinterest. And I share my Live Binders with my students so they have access to the same resources too. And then we have the T, which is trigger critical thinking and creative thinking. And my ultimate goal as a teacher really is to teach students how to access and process information rather than just absorb whatever facts I throw at them. And I think we're probably all in that same boat. So I think um, you know, we're not gatekeepers of information anymore as teachers. It used to be that way, I think. And now they have just as much access to information as we do. And our job is to just guide them through how to process it you know, with a critical mind, and then hopefully do something creative with it, you know, synthesize it, add to it. And that's what I use tech tools for. So. Um, that's all we're really going to do with this Prezi. I'm going to go back now to the slideshow. OK. OK, so another thing I wanted to bring up is um, how the Common Core addresses technology. And it doesn't have, you know, right now there aren't like technology standards in the Common Core, but technology is sort of woven throughout the standards. And since I teach language arts, that's mainly my focus. Um, but if you look into the vision statement for language arts, it does say that the students are going to employ technology thoughtfully to enhance their reading, writing, speaking, listening, language use, and that they tailor their searches online to acquire useful information efficiently and integrate what they learn using technology with what they learn offline. So it's kind of that bridge, that meshing of the two worlds. And that they're familiar, this is really important, I think, that they're familiar with the strengths and limitations of various technological tools and mediums and can select and use those best suited for their communication goals. So just teaching them how to, again, critically analyze what's out there and pick and choose the best tools for their own learning and for, and for sharing their work. And so that's really something that I focus on in my classroom. Um, then we have in the Common Core also, these um, capacities of the literate individual. And I really try to develop these with my students. This is what I also want to sort of mesh into my lesson plan so that they're demonstrating independence. And actually, a lot of these kind of blend well into um, my district has gifted strands, which I didn't include in this presentation. But we have eight gifted strands that we're supposed to also incorporate into our lessons. And these kind of, I think, marry well with those, but they, they demonstrate independence, they build strong content knowledge, they respond to the varying demands of audience, task, purpose, and discipline, which you're going to see me talk about through the rest of the presentation. Um, they comprehend as well as critique, I and mean, we know that critiquing is such a high level of thinking. And then they use technology and did, 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 uh, digital media strategically and capably, so there's that again, and they come to understand other perspectives and culture. So, these are all things that I'm going to be mentioning as I go through the actual examples that I've got for you guys today. OK, so now I'm going to take you on a little tour of a few sites that I like to use that I think fit all the criteria we've been talking about in the critical sift, as well as the demands of the Common Core. We're going to start with Wrangle. Um, I'm actually kind of new to Wrangle. I've only been using it for a few weeks. But you know how it is when you find a new one, you want to tell everybody about it. So I, I thought I would include it in the presentation. I am the sponsor of the Speech and Dictation debate club at my school. And this is my first year as the sponsor, so I'm kind of feeling my way <laughs> through that. And I came across this really great site that um, 
give sort of a visual for the debate. The students go in and they plop in their debate topic, and they're allowed to, um, you have to kind of divide them into two teams, and then they can just put in their arguments, then they can respond to one another with counter arguments. And you can see here on the slide that then they, when you um, label whether it's an argument or a counter argument, it will draw the lines back and forth, which is a really great sort of intro into debate. And that's what we're using it now. It's the beginning of this school year. So we're still getting our feet wet. And they're still nervous about talking in front of each other. So this is a really nice way to kind of get the thinking skills and the, the habits of mind that you're going to need for a debate without them having to stand up in front of everybody and do it out loud, which can be really overwhelming for a lot of students. This way they can sort of, on their own time, quietly and without the pressure of an audience, build a debate that has all of the pieces and practice with that argument, counter argument. Um, and they have time to stop and go and do extra research if they feel like they need to. So it's kind of a good baby step into real live debates. And um, it's been really fun for us so far. I think I included a slide. Yes, here's the one that we're working on. This is a very rough draft. I, I had to grab it last week for the presentation um, to get everything ready. But this is our very, very first debate in, in the club. We're looking at should students be allowed to use personal electronic devices at school. And that's always a, a fun topic for the students. I know different districts have different rules about that. At our school, um, they're not allowed to have their phones or laptops or e-readers or any of that kind of stuff um, in the classroom. They can bring them to campus. They have to put them in their locker. And they can only use them before and after school. So my students, of course, wish that they could use them more at school. And so this has been a really fun one just to get them started. And so um, I think that, let me go back one more slide here. Um, you can see I put here in the, in the white text above the picture, um, this is pulled right out of those capacities for the literate individual that students can without significant scaffolding comprehend and evaluate complex text, which is what they're researching. They're finding out um, about the topic across a range of types and disciplines, and they can construct effective arguments, which is what we're trying to get them to do, and convey intricate or multifaceted information. So I think this is a great site for that kind of skill building. And so far, the students have really enjoyed it. And I think it's going to be a successful way to, to get them introduced to debate. I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to just move along. I wish I could stand stay on each slide for a while, but we're going to just do a quick tour. So the next um, thing I wanted to show you it was a Facebook PowerPoint template that um, I found online. And there are several versions out there. Um, there should be a link to the site that I actually pulled this one from. I'm not going to take you guys there because I just pulled a slide and I think that'll work just fine. But um, you know the the cool thing about this is that it's already made for you. It is an older version, obviously, of Facebook. So if you wanted to build your own and make it a little more up to date, you could. I teach sixth graders. Most of them don't have Facebook accounts. They're not technically supposed to because they're under 13. So some of them do, of course. But um, a lot of them don't know exactly what it looks like anyway, so they don't mind that it's an old version. If you had older students, they might look at you like, what is this, you know? <laughs> but you could update it yourself if you have the know-how to do that. It's just a PowerPoint. And what's nice is when you, when you pull this offline, it comes up just as a regular PowerPoint. So you can tinker with it as much as you want. And um, just from a how-to perspective, um, they've got it already linked so that when you click on at the top, if you click on wall, or if you click on photos, if you click on flare, um, they've got the slides linked so that it will actually automatically take you to that slide. So it kind of feels like a real you know, face point, or face point, Facebook um, wall to the students. And what I used it with um, for this particular assignment is I wanted them to really dive into the play. We were reading Hamlet, and um, this is from last year. Uh, we were reading Hamlet, and I wanted them to really get into a specific character's point of view and sort of view the events of the play from that point of view and use their inferencing skills to figure out how the characters were feeling, you know, what they were thinking as the events of the plot unfolded. And this was a really great way for them to 
relate to their character and explore their character and um, just kind of get into that character's head and share with us what they thought the character was, um, was up to, even if we didn't see them in the play, what they might have been doing um, during that time. I didn't pull out the whole, this particular slideshow this student made I think was about 15 slides. So I just pulled a couple to kind of show you what they look like. Um, they had a blast, you know, looking at the time period, um, finding pictures to represent everybody in the play. Um, they did have to, let me see, there's another page here. They had to fill out the info page. And some of them did a better job than others. This one I thought was kind of funny because, um, you know, they put political views, feudalism. And it was interesting because we were actually studying, or they were studying in social studies at this time. Um, you know, medieval Europe, and so that was a nice connection across the disciplines for them. Um, but I love this part, favorite music, sad emo music for Hamlet, and I can't live if living is without you. <laughs> um, we had quite a fun time coming up with appropriate uh, songs. Some of them put favorite TV shows, favorite movies, favorite books, and those got to be pretty interesting too. And you could really tell, it was a great assessment, did the students understand this particular character and what they were like. I had one for Polonius, and of course, if you're familiar with Hamlet, Polonius basically never shuts up. He's a talker. And so they had a lot of fun um, just having him ramble on forever. Um, and that was a great way for me to see that they understood what this character was all about. Um, there are five, I think, choices for Facebook uh, templates on the website that I pulled this one from. And I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure I picked the first one, but you can you know experiment with what's out there and see if there's one that that, that works better for you guys. But um, I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful, so I'm going to keep going. The next thing I wanted to show you guys was a great website called Storybird, and some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and it's a way for students to publish and get a real audience, which is always fun. Um, it's a really beautiful website with, um, they've, they've matched up with artists, there's hundreds of artists on the site that have um, given up their, their work to be used as illustrations and the students can pick from just gorgeous artwork. And another cool thing about it is they can actually, once they've created a book and they've added their own text and they've put the illustrations from the professional artists with it, they can order. You can order hard copies, and they have all different sizes, and they'll actually deliver them to the student's house if you want to. Or you can make a class book if you want to collaborate, and you can print them for your classroom. So that's a kind of a cool feature for this. Um, and I put over here on the side, again, some more language from those um, common core capacities of the literate individual, which I'm not going to read through. But um, if you want to go back and see, I think, how this um, meshes with the common core. Now I'm going to try this, hopefully, to take you to, um, girls, can you remind me really quick if I'm doing, if I want to just take them into Storybird, is that web, that's application Yes, sharing. you're going to use application sharing for this one so that you can advance the pages, otherwise it will open in a full screen and it won't be part of the recording. Okay. Now, OK, sorry. <laughs> I'll get the hang of this. OK, here we go. Can everybody see that now? Hopefully, I'm going to move this out of the way. Does that look right to everyone? OK, so this is. Um, this is Storybird, and I've logged in as the student so you can see what the edit menu looks like. And um, what's interesting about this site, and what I think makes kind of ups the ante in terms of the cognitive you know, demand that we're putting on the students, is that, yes, you have all this gorgeous artwork. Um, and the students, you select an artist that they want to use for their artwork. And um, then they're locked into that artist. So what that means is they cannot use you know, a picture from one artist on the first page and then go find a different picture from a different artist for the second page. They're only allowed to pick from the illustrations from that particular artist. So for this assignment, we've been doing a fairy tale unit. And um, they had to adapt a, a fairy tale, a classic fairy tale. And they had a few options of how they could adapt it. And then we, we went to Storybird. 
And what happens is, you know, they, they start to look up pictures and try to find an artist that has a lot of pictures that are going to match their story or the idea they have in their head for their story. But they're not going to find exactly every picture that they probably want to find when they start out. So I would get a lot of students saying, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I'm telling the three little pigs. And, you know, I found this artist who has a lot of good pig pictures, <laughs> but they don't have, you know, they don't have enough or they don't have everything that I want. And so then what happens is they really have to think, you know, outside the box. Then we start having that conversation about, OK, well, how are you going to adapt? How are you going to make this work? And, um, and the pictures, there's an interplay between the text coming from the author, the pictures coming from the illustrator. And even though they're not, they're not talking to one another, there is a collaboration because they, they have to work together and find a way to create a story that combines these two elements, the text and the pictures. And it can take them in directions they never expected the story to go. It can really prompt a lot of um, you know, just imaginative, creative directions that um, they didn't even know they had. And um, this particular one, I just want to show you. It's gorgeous. Let's see how I, oops, let me see here. Oh, I see. OK. So he changed it to Beast and the Beauty. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but I just think this is a sixth grader. A long time ago, I was taking my morning walk through the forest. I was terribly lonely. It had been many years since I had seen my fellow man. The curse turning me into a beast was slowly destroying my heart. I had heard a noise in the edge of the forest, separate from the chirp, chirp of the birds and the crunch of leaves under my feet. A beautiful woman emerged from the edge of the woods, singing a marvelous tune. I took her away to my forest home. You can see how um, I love that line. I fed her the finest pastry, golden brown, and filled with sweet cream. Anyway, great kid, really smart kid, obviously. Um, and he put together this beautiful adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. And, and he did. He had to work around the illustrations that were available to him. And, um, and he said afterwards that actually he was much happier with the story he wound up with than what he had initially kind of expected to write when he came to the site. So um, that's Storybird, and I highly recommend it. They have um, some more cartoonish kinds of illustrations, and then they have these also these really gorgeous, um, more mature illustrations. It's just a, it's a wonderful site, and I love, love that you can actually get a hard copy um, if you order them. OK, I'm trying to be mindful of my time. So let me go back to the slideshow. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was Glogster. And there's actually two Glogster sites, so you have to kind of be careful. There's regularglogster.com, and then there's edu Glogster. And the edu is um, it's free up to a point. I did go ahead and buy an account because I wanted to have, um, I wanted to be able to tie all of my student accounts to mine. So if you want to really go the free route, each student can make up their own account. And they can just, you know, just make sure you get the links to all of their work that you want to view. Um, I did pay for an account so that I could have all of their, um, their work within my account. I just log in and everything is there. And basically what Glockster is all about is they um, are able to make these really cool interactive uh, posters. So it's a great sort of summative assessment if you want to use that as an alternative to a traditional poster or a PowerPoint or something like that. Um, they're highly engaging. Again, you have that audience built right in. And they definitely have a lot of room for creativity. I mean, none of the glogs that my students have ever made look anything like any other student blog. They, there's so much room for individual um, expression. So um, again, I've got the language there from the Common Core if you want to see how that matches up. Let me see. Um, OK, let me, we're not quite ready for that. So I'm going to now do the same thing. I'm going to go back to application sharing. And I'm going to show you two blogs that my students have made. Let me just, um, there we go. OK, so for this blog, um, we were doing a media literacy unit. And students were learning about persuasive techniques and propaganda. We were looking a lot at advertising. And one of the little projects they had to do was to create their own ad using a persuasive technique that we had been studying. So this student, uh, Ben, created this blog. It's basically like a poster, as you can see. He's able to add text. He can add pictures. 
And then he went outside the, the, the site and made, um, on some kind of animation site, a little movie which he was able to embed right into his poster. I'm going to, if you press play, you can watch the little movie. And I'm supposed to remind you also that if you have a scrolling mouse, and you try to scroll while your mouse is in the or your cursor is in the middle of the screen. It's not going to let you do that. You can Holly, we can't tr press play if you're in app sharing. We can only oh. do that in web tour. Oh, so you can let me go press play and we can see it, but it'll be a little bit jerky. Okay. What do you think? Should I go to web tour? Yeah. Why don't you open in web tour? It'll be less bandwidth for people. Okay. Sorry about that, you guys. Not a problem. Is there any way you can plop this URL in there? Oh, wait, no, I haven't. Hold on one second. Let me grab it. Just grab this. Copy. It's a very short little movie. Um, I think it's like 20 seconds long, Max. <laughs> so, um, okay. If you scroll down, um, you can press play, hopefully, and see the little animation my student built. This is his ad for his product that he made up, some kind of gummy, gummy balls. <laughs> um, he's using bribery in his little ad. Um, so I just wanted to show you how that works. You can add a text. You can embed links into these little posters. You can, of course, um, embed YouTube videos or animation, any, pretty much anything. And then what was really neat was, let me grab this other um, URL, because remember when we were going over um, the vision statement for the uh, Language Arts Common Core, we saw that one of the things we really want to be doing with our students is getting them to a place where they can evaluate what um, you know, what websites are out there that are useful for them and what tools they can use and transfer from, you know, one discipline to the next. So I guess it doesn't let me paste. Oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think this is pretty neat. Um, this student um, learned about Glockster with me in language arts. And then in a science class, um, he was given a project where he had to present on the annular solar eclipse that happened last year. And so he, his science teacher came to me and said, did you use this site with your students? And I said, yeah, yeah, he just learned how to do that in my class. And she said, well, it's really fun. And he asked me if he could do this in my class for his project. And you know, I gave him the green light. So he did, and he shared it with us. And, and um, everybody was really impressed, I guess, with his little project. You can see he was able to put video in here, too, and some other um, information. So I was really excited that he, um, you know, that he found a tool and then owned it, you know, that he now it's part of his toolbox and he's able to take that with him to other classes and make use of it when appropriate. So that's really what I'm hoping for for my students um, is that they don't just make something cute for my class and that's the end of it, that they really have discovered a new way to express themselves and present information and that that's going to make them more successful in any class. So. Um, I'm going to get out of this and go back to, of course, all these links are in the live binder, so you can come back to it um, later. So again, I just repeated that here and, and took the language out of the Common Core about you know, how the student was able to transfer that knowledge. Another, and I'm going to have to move quickly here, but another site that I have really fallen in love with for students, especially because it offers individualized practice and immediate feedback, which is really important with students with IEPs, of course. We want to really try to individualize um, their instruction, but really for every teacher. This has been a time saver for me, which I love, because they do work on this site and it grades it. And I, I can get reports printed, and I, it's easy to just transfer it, transfer it into my grade book. So from a very practical standpoint, I love this site. But also, it just um, it's a really cool site because what you do is, and again, I think I went ahead and bought a paid membership to this. You don't have to. There is a free version, too. But um, I did pay, I think, uh, uh, for an account. And what you do is you upload your vocabulary list. Um, you could do this for math words, science words, social studies, obviously language arts, whatever. Um, and then the students 
you can assign them homework. Um, let me show you the next page. Um, talk about engagement. When they're studying their vocabulary words, they can play all of these games, and it, they're tailored to their own vocabulary list that I've uploaded. I can assign these activities as homework, and then the students get a little notice that they have homework, and they love to tell their parents that they have homework on the computer and that they get to play a game. It's not all games, of course. There's writing practice. There's little tests. Um, it's got audio, so it will spell the words for them out loud. It will use the words in a sentence. It will um, quiz them. Um, there's flashcards on the screen, and they can also print the flashcards out if they prefer to have them you know, in their hand or bring them to school. Um, it lets me know as the teacher what activities they've done, um, what assignments they've completed, how long it took them to complete the assignments, how many extra assignments they chose to do on their own. And this gives me such great data to talk to them about you know, how they're doing in class, especially on the vocab quizzes that we take or whenever we do an activity with vocab. And if they're struggling, it's usually because they haven't done much practice. And I can show them you know, to the minute how much time they've spent. And we can sometimes compare that to another student anonymously. But look, this student spent twice as much time as you studying. And guess what happened to their grade? And we can have those conversations. And um, the parents love it, too, because the parents can get in there and see what the students are learning. And they have a way to keep track of how much studying their students are doing. So um, this has been a really fun little website. And uh, I just wanted to plug it real quick. But um, you can check it out if you haven't already. It's, it's a lot of fun. OK, and then Edmodo. Uh, it looks like about half of you were using Edmodo, I think. And um, again, I have totally fallen in love with Edmodo. And it has transformed how I run my classroom. I feel like it's our, it's our digital classroom. And so um, there's a lot of features on Edmodo. It's basically set up kind of like Facebook. It reminds me a lot of Facebook, except it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of Facebook. And it's also password protected. And it's made for educators to use with students. So um, it's very safe. Parents can, can join in, too, and they can keep an eye on things. Nobody can get into this room unless they're invited with our special um, code, which I'll be changing now that you can see it. Um, but that's fine. So um, one of the things you can do through Edmodo is, is polls, which I love. And you can see here um, that I had my students answer a poll, um, I guess last week or the week before. And I said, OK, let's talk about our weekly vocab. What thinking skill is SpellingCity.com designed to help with the most? And we've been talking about thinking skills. And of course, we've been working on our vocab and Spelling City. And I wanted to bring those two worlds together and get them to apply what we were learning about thinking skills to what we were actually doing in class. And so they've been voting. And um, you know, of course, when I made the poll, I put synthesis, evaluation, recall, and prediction. And I was thinking recall, because it's mostly you just do you remember the definitions. It's really helpful for spelling and the definitions and, and parts of speech. That's kind of what that site's designed to do. And I kept getting these votes for evaluation. And I, in my head, I was thinking, oh, gosh, do they really still not understand the difference between <laughs> recall and evaluation? And I wasn't able to fit from the screenshot the conversation that was happening below. But the students started talking about why they voted the way they voted. And the students who voted evaluation started to say things like, well, I use the site to evaluate how I'm learning or how much I'm learning about my vocabulary. And I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, that is kind of what you're doing. <laughs> and I thought, you know, these kids always just find, um, find things you never thought about. And, and so both answers, you know, I can, I can see how they can defend both answers. And so that's been a really fun feature for me is, uh, is to give these polls out. Um, I can also put videos here. I have videos in here for my students. Sometimes I, I videotape them doing things, their presentations. And I will upload those onto Edmodo so that period one, maybe they did a really cool video. And I want everybody to see it, periods two, you know, three, four, five. And so they can all get in there. And it's sort of expanded um, my student community from just period to period to everybody. So um, now my students in first period are talking with my students in seventh period about the same thing, because they're learning the you know, same things in both periods. But it's just given us a wider audience. And it's given us an ability to, um, to share the work and, and have conversations around what they're doing in class. I have another slide here. Um, another, I think, benefit of Edmodo is that they get to share perspectives. They get to disagree. They get to. Um, 
basically play with social media, but it's very supervised because, um, again, it's it's totally password protected, and um, parents are in there too, and, and there's teachers in there, and it's very transparent. They cannot chat with one another. It doesn't have that feature. So there's no secret um, conversations going on that I can't monitor. And so here, um, I cut off the top, but you can see they were doing a little challenge, and you can just see their feet. They were trying to turn a blanket over without stepping off of it. And, and now they're discussing their strategies and about what worked and what didn't work. And, and so they're having that experience of a social media situation, but it's, it's not scary. And we're being able to you know, teach them how do you interact politely and with integrity online. We can talk about their social footprint, you know, their, their digital footprint, and how things don't go away. And you want to make sure you're careful about what you say. Um, and so it's just a really great way um, to have those kinds of lessons. Uh, we, we don't have Facebook at school. It's blocked. And of course, like I said, my students are way too young to, um, to even you know, officially get a Facebook page. But I think we do them a disservice when we don't have these kinds of explicit lessons um, on how to behave in those kinds of arenas. And this gives me a chance to do that. OK, I'm officially out of time. But planbook.com, um, this was my last little thing. It's just a way that you can do your lesson planning online. And you can give the code to your students and parents, and they can see what you're doing in class. They can go back and look at things that they missed from an absence. You can, you can put your standards in there. So there's a record of what standards you're teaching. You can put homework in there. There's a calendar feature. And they can print PDFs. And so I just wanted to, to talk about that to kind of wrap up, because it's a way to communicate how all of your lessons, including your technology lessons, and you can put links in there too for your site, um, wrap back up into the standards. And, um, and that's how you share. Last thing, very last thing, is to help students keep track of all these resources, because we're sending them from site to site. And that can get overwhelming. So in their agendas, at my school students have agendas, I've printed out a little page here for them to keep track of their websites and login information. And I would really recommend that for, um, for teachers who are going to use a lot of different uh, sites that have accounts for students, because um, that way, they're not coming to you every time you go to the computer lab saying, I don't remember how to get into this site. I can't remember. That's a real time suck. And so I have found that this is a lifesaver for me and the students. They have their you know, organized list of what website address it is, why they would be using that, that site, what the purpose is, and how to get in. So I think we're, we're out of time. And I wanted to have some time for questions, I think. So um, if there are any questions that you might have, um, we ask that you type them in the chat. And if you'd like to take the mic, we'd be happy to give you the mic. Um, I took down one question, is, and it was about um, could this tool, and I forgot which tool it was referring to, uh, to be used to help younger kids plan their persuasive essay. And I think it was talking about the uh, Wrangle tool. Oh, OK. All right. So how do I actually see the question? Um, or is that just the question? Was can That was the it? question. Could Wrangle help students um, plan a per persuasive essay? I haven't used it yet for that purpose. I don't see why not. Um, they could probably have the conversation back and forth with themselves. You know, it wouldn't have to be multiple students going in and entering um, both sides of the, of the debate. I could see how you could easily, just as one person, kind of go back and forth and frame out your argument um, and figure out how those arguments connect to one another. Um, yeah, I think you could totally do that. I don't know right. that print. I haven't played with that part yet as far as like what the print um, capabilities are. That would be my only um, reservation, is I'm not sure how easy it is to print out on something that would be useful as kind of a pre-writing. And that's a good point, Peggy, that you could use it with teachers, parents, um, that there's a lot of possibilities besides uh, just debating with students. Um, Lori, did you take down any questions that I might have missed?
Yes, I do have a couple, Kim. Okay, great. Um, one was, does anybody have any recommendations on Facebook templates that, that students could use? Um, I know that the, the link that I have has, I think, a list of maybe five. Okay. Um, but like, but like the one I use is a little outdated in terms of its appearance. There's probably now some more updated ones out there, um, but I haven't. I'm happy with the one that I have for now for the reasons that I told you that I haven't gone out to look for more mm -hmm. current ones. I don't know. And I know that Richard Byrne on the free technology, yeah, free technology. Those right there and free technology for tools that Richard Byrne, his, his blog, he has several that he's written as well. And the other one I had had to do with Wrangle again, I think, and that was, um, could Wrangle be more, could be more than, would it be more of a debate researching tool or could it be any viewpoint, taking a point of view in any topic? Um, well, I don't see. I don't, I don't know the limitations of it. Like I said, I've only been using it for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was so excited about what it was doing for me for my speech and debate club that I wanted to share it. And I can see it being really useful, probably for anything. The little. Um, if I go, do you want me to go back to that slide? Uh, let me go backwards here. Here, I mean, they're having a very silly argument on on the the basic page here to just illustrate how it works. Um, so I think you could do anything. I mean, this would be fun for your um, for your own children. You know, if they want to raise in their allowance or <laughs> they want to get a pet rabbit or whatever, you know, you could use this um, for I think anything. And you could do it for votes you're taking in your classroom. You know, what is our class motto going to be? What's our class mascot going to be? Um, you know, how do we want to frame or word our, our vision statement? I mean, you could probably do this for, for anything. Um, what reward do we want to have on Friday? Mm -hmm. You know, you know like, I, I think you know, it's why have, you want to vote for each candidate or something. But yes, definitely. That would be a really great way to, to, to get the kids involved in the, in, the, in the elections that are coming up, I think. Mm -hmm. So they seem what the candidates are offering, what their stances are on their platforms. That might be something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, what I've been trying to convince my students, and this does take a little work, especially with sixth graders, is that the best, you know, the most skilled arguer, if you want to, you know, debater, is somebody who can argue both sides. And you got to know what your, what your opponent is going to have up their sleeve and then be able to predict and, and anticipate what's coming. So uh, when you put it in that terms, then it becomes kind of like a game for them, a puzzle, and they want to outthink their opponent. Until you do that, then they don't want to give any thought to what the other person is going to say, because they're right, gosh darn it, and that's all there is to it. But when you make sure that they understand that if you really want to win, you got to be able to outthink and outsmart the other person. So you need to know what all their arguments are going to be before they ever walk into the room. And that's made a big difference. And I think this website, you know, you're forced to think about the other side. So I like that component. Did students need separate accounts? No. Right. One funky thing about this is that um, you can see from this slide that when you go there, you click Start a Debate. It lets you put in, you know, kind of a neutral description of the debate and what the basics are on both sides as well as your topic. And then um, you have to save that URL. You can't, as you can see on the screen here, there's nowhere to like log oh, in. Okay. So you just have to save your URL, and it will take you right back in there. They do need a Gmail account to access it. So what I did was I set up a dummy account on Gmail for my debate club, and they just okay. they don't have to actually log into Gmail. They just have to use the the um, username and password, which is you know like debate club or whatever, something very basic. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to keep in mind if you're going to use Wrangle is that when the kids go to it, they're going to have to use a Gmail account to get in, but, but you can make up your own. 
Okay, that's that's good to know for when they uh, want to access it. And that's a good point about having to know both sides um, so they can expect and be able to rebut their side and be able right. to expect the, uh, the other's argument. And you can also take that URL and embed it right into your Edmodo page and the students can click on it anytime they can think of another argument or they can also um, share resources with one another. So if they're doing a debate in class and you've got your two teams or whatever um, and they want to share resources, ooh, I just found this great site that talks all about the benefits of having a pet bunny or whatever, then they can link that right into the Edmodo and they can and they can go into Wrangle and use the information from that link to um, you know bolster their argument. So you, you really that's why I love Edmodo is because it's a way to it's one stop shopping. They can go right there and then link out to each of these other resources that I want them to use. Besides the elections, I used to do at Christmas time, holiday time, um, why your parents should get you a certain particular gift. Right. Yeah. Oh, red wine or white wine. <laughs> Good idea. Rosemary, would you like to comment on that to uh, the, uh, the discussion? We'd love to have your comments as well. Just let us know if you if you uh, have a mic, and I will give you the mic, and you can. We'd love to have you contribute. If so, just click on the hand, and uh, we'll give you the mic, Rosemary. And that goes for anybody if you'd like to contribute. We'd love to have you. I'm going to go ahead and formally close out the show, but we do uh, welcome and ask everybody if you'd like to stick around uh, and continue asking questions. You're welcome to do so, but we want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, we do know that uh, we want to be respectful of your time, and uh, we know that we try to stick to the one hour time. On September 24th, Steve Harganam will be interviewing uh, Nikhil Goyle. And on September 25th, okay, we're not going to go over the hour. We're going to stick to the to it. Okay. Um, on September 25th, we are going uh, to, uh, Steve's going to be interviewing Ron Retart on September 26th. He's going to be interviewing um, Dave Cormier and a panel talking about MOOC, um, the uh, large open uh, courses. And on September 27th, He'll be talking with Thomas Vander Arken on Getting Smart. And we want to let you know that on September 29th, David Truss will be, um, next Notre Dame, will be on our show. And then we will, on October 6th, we will have Karen Mincy. And then on the October 13th, we will have the K-12 online conference preview with the uh, co-conveners who will be talking with uh, about the presenters and how the conference works. And if this is new to you, this is going to be a great session. And then on the 20th, there won't be a show um, in order that everybody can go to the Den Fall Virtual Conference. So um, we want to let everybody know about that. Uh, we don't really have an active Facebook page we do work off of the um, classroom2.0.com name, but we do have a website that we actively use. And we want to let you know that if you can nominate a teacher, and all of the links are in our live binder and off of our website. And um, there's the link as well. Please nominate any educator that works with um, colleagues, teachers, students as well. 
as soon as you exit the session, you can um, a survey link will open. You don't have to do anything. It automatically opens for you. And we hope that you'll give us feedback on today's session as well as future guests and topics. We're always uh, interested in that. Anytime you watch a recording, you can also um, use that link as well. As well as today and future sessions, you can request a certificate of for your professional development. And all you need to do is put in your name and your email address, and Peggy will get that to you. And all of our recordings are posted on our archives page, or you can subscribe to them through our iTunes U channel, and that is in our live binders, um, the link as well. Or you can subscribe through an RSS feed and get all of the links and information as well using that as well. So you have several different options to get all of the recording links and information after each show. And we want to let you know, thank, give a very special thank you to Holly for joining us today, as well as to Steve, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0, and to Weebly and to Blackboard for allowing us to have a website and this forum each and every week, as well as to each of you for joining us each week and sharing and contributing to uh, the conversation every week and making our show so successful with the content that you share. So we're very excited that you have joined us today. Um, thank you for coming and contributing. Please uh, remember next Saturday we will also uh, be here at the same time and we'll have David Trust with us, and that will be another exciting session. He's just fantastic, full of all kinds of knowledge and experience. He's been, uh, he's from Canada, but he's been in China and overseas, and just a great wealth of information. So we hope that you'll join us next week as well. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great Saturday and a great weekend. And we will we will see you online and take care everybody <laughs>